Hey everyone and welcome back. You know, today is a pretty special day for astronomy. Um, it is. It's the 100th anniversary Yeah. of us knowing that the Milky Way isn't alone. That's right. That our galaxy is just one of many out there in the universe. So it's, it's, in this yeah. deep dive, we're going to go back in time. Yeah. And we're going to look at how that discovery happened. We've got a whole bunch of sources. We're going to look at old newspaper articles, scientific papers, whoa, whoa. even some personal letters from the astronomers involved. Really get interested. It must be fascinating to read yeah. those personal letters. Oh, yeah. Like get inside their minds a little bit. Yeah. As they're figuring all of this stuff out. I bet. And we're going to meet some of the key players, too, of course. Yeah. Edwin Hubble, the man yeah, who uh, made the discovery. But also Henrietta Leavitt and Harlow Shapley. Right. Um, so to really appreciate this whole discovery... We have to understand what astronomers thought back then. Yeah. Before Hubble, they thought that the Milky Way galaxy was the entire universe. That's right. Yeah. So all those fuzzy patches of light. Nebulae. They saw through their telescopes. Yeah. They just thought those were nebulae, uh, clouds right. of gas and dust inside of our own galaxy. It's hard to imagine now, isn't it? It really is. Like, that was the whole universe. Yeah. It's almost like a little kid's understanding or something. Yeah. You know, it must have been such a limited view of the cosmos, but think about the challenges that they faced. You know, trying to measure the distance to these faint, fuzzy nebula. I mean, yeah, how would you even do that? How it's like trying to tell if a light in the distance is a tiny firefly a few feet away. Oh, yeah. Or like a giant spotlight miles away. Right. With the tools that they had back then, it was incredibly difficult. Yeah. So how did they even start to figure this out? Like, how did they even approach the, this? The key was finding what astronomers call standard candles. Okay. Objects in space that have a known brightness. And if you know how bright something actually is, you can calculate its distance based on how faint it appears to us here on Earth. So it's like if you know the wattage of a light bulb. Exactly. A 100-watt light bulb is going to look much fainter a mile away exactly. than it does up close. That's a great analogy. Yeah. That's exactly how it works. So they're basically trying to find a standard candle in one of these fuzzy nebulae yeah. yes. to see if they can figure out how far away it is and if it's outside the Milky Way. Exactly. And one type of star called a Cepheid variable okay. turned out to be the perfect standard candle for this task. Oh, interesting. But the story of how they figured out how to use Cepheid variables is really interesting. Oh, yeah. It involves a brilliant astronomer named Henrietta Leavitt and her work on a nearby dwarf galaxy called the Small Magellanic Cloud. So Henrietta Leavitt, now, this is where things start getting really interesting. Yeah. It's the early 1900s, and she's working at Harvard College Observatory. Right. But she wasn't an astronomer the way we think of today. She's a computer. Yes. One of a group of women who were tasked with analyzing photographic plates. Right. Of the night sky, meticulously measuring and cataloging all the stars. It's hard to imagine doing that all day long. The, I, can you imagine? Yeah. Just looking at these you know, glass plate. Painstaking work. Yeah, and doing all these calculations by hand. I mean, I complain when my computer's a little slow. I know, right. Can you imagine? And it was tedious and often overlooked work. Absolutely. But leave it, despite facing some significant challenges, you know, including health issues. Oh, really? Approached her work with incredible dedication and a sharp eye for detail. I didn't realize she had health issues. What What were they? Well, she was battling hearing loss wow. throughout her career, which must have made that work even more challenging. Yeah. <laughs> but she persevered and made this discovery that would revolutionize our understanding of the universe. Wow. So what exactly was her big discovery? So she was studying Cepheid variable stars mm. in the small Magellanic cloud. Okay. These stars, they're special because their brightness fluctuates oh. in this predictable pattern. Okay. They brighten and dim over a specific period of time. What Leavitt discovered after meticulously analyzing countless photographic plates was a direct relationship between a Cepheid's period of pulsation and its intrinsic brightness. Okay. The longer the period, the brighter the star. Okay, so she's basically saying that just by looking at how long it takes a Cepheid variable star to brighten and dim, yes. we can tell how bright it actually is. Exactly. That's incredible. 
It is. It's like finding a cosmic ruler. That's exactly what it became. A ruler for measuring these vast cosmic distances. So now astronomers had this reliable way to determine the distance to any Cepheid variable star they could find, yes. no matter how far away it was. That's right. That's huge. Yeah. Okay, so we've got our standard candle, the Cepheid variable, thanks to Henrietta Leavitt. But how does Edwin Hubble fit into all this? Yeah. He's the one that ultimately proved the existence of other galaxies, right? He is, yeah. So Hubble was working at the Mount Wilson Observatory in California, right. home to the Hooker Telescope, which was the most powerful telescope in the world at that time. Wow. And he was focused on a particular target, the Andromeda Nebula, okay. which was one of the most prominent and mysterious objects in the night sky. And I bet he was really eager to test out Henrietta Leavitt's discovery. Absolutely. He must have been searching for Cephe variables in Andromeda, yeah. hoping to finally settle the debate about whether it was just a nebula in our galaxy yeah. or something much more distant. Exactly. And what he found would change our understanding of the universe forever. Okay. But before we get to that, we need to talk about another key figure, Harlow Shapley. Remember him? Yes, the one who believed that the Milky Way was the entire universe. That's right. So he was involved in the big debate, right? He was. Yeah, the great debate. That's right. In 1920, Shapley, who believed the Milky Way was enormous and contained everything, right. went head to head with another astronomer, Heber Curtis, okay. who argued that there were other island universes Okay. Separate galaxies out there. It was a real showdown. Yeah, it was a battle. About the very nature of the universe. It really was, yeah. I bet it was intense who won. Well, that's the thing. Neither of them really won at the time. Oh. Both sides had compelling arguments based on the evidence they had available. So they just had to agree to disagree. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. It was a classic scientific impasse that could only be resolved with more precise measurements. Okay. And that's where Edwin Hubble and his search for Cepheid variables in Andromeda comes in. Okay, so the stage is set. Yeah. We've got Henrietta Leavitt's Cepheid variables. Yes. Harlow Shafley's giant Milky Way universe. Right. And Edwin Hubble armed with the most powerful telescope in the world. Yeah. Aiming for Andromeda. It's all coming together. This is where it all comes together. Yeah, it is. I can't wait to find out what happens next. Me either. But we're going to have to wait because we're out of time for this segment. That's right. So we'll pick up the story in the next part of this deep dive. Sounds good. Stay tuned. Can't wait. Welcome back. So before the break, we were talking about Edwin Hubble and how he was searching for those Cepheid variable stars in the Andromeda Nebula, right? Those cosmic mile markers, thanks to Henrietta Lovett. Yeah. The suspense is killing me. <laughs> Did he find them? Was Andromeda just a cloud inside the Milky Way, or was it another galaxy? Well, imagine you're Hubble. You're staring through this massive telescope night after night. <laughs> you're poring over these photographic plates of Andromeda. Right. It's tedious work, but then there it is, a Cepheid variable passing mm. away. So he found it. He found it. Wow. But here's the thing. Based on Levitt's period luminosity relationship, this particular Cepheid was way too faint to be inside of the Milky Way. So that's it. Game over. That single observation just blew the lid off the whole Milky Way as the entire universe idea. It really did. It was a paradigm shift. And we even have a glimpse into Harlow Shapley's reaction to this news. Oh, really? Yeah. He was sent a letter outlining Hubble's discovery. And he reportedly said, here is the letter that has destroyed my universe. Oh, wow. That's kind of sad, but also kind of beautiful. Yeah. You know, to have your whole understanding of the universe just completely overturned like that. Yeah. It really speaks to the nature of scientific progress sometimes, you know, or, our most cherished theories, they get challenged and overturned by new evidence. And that's a good thing. It is. It means we're learning and refining our understanding of the cosmos. Exactly. Right. So Hubble proves that Andromeda is a galaxy. Right. Far beyond our own. But did he stop there? Oh, I doubt it. He yeah. seems like the kind of guy who just keeps going. You're right about that. Okay. He went on to find Cephides in other nebulae as well, confirming that they too were these distant galaxies. Wow. So the universe just got a whole lot bigger. It did, but then it gets even more interesting. There's another piece of the puzzle that comes into play, something called redshift. Redshift? Okay. <laughs> I remember learning about that in school, but I can use a refresher. Yeah. What is redshift and what does it have to do with galaxies? Okay. So imagine you're standing on a street corner and an ambulance races by with its siren blaring. Okay. As it comes towards you, the siren sounds higher pitched, right? Yeah. And as it moves away, the pitch drops. Right. That's the Doppler effect. Okay. 
Sound waves getting compressed as the source moves towards you and stretched out as it moves away. Okay, I get that. Yeah? But we're talking about light from galaxies, not sound waves. Right. Well, this is where it gets mind-blowing. Light waves behave in a similar way. Really? Yeah. When an object in space is moving away from us, the light it emits gets stretched shifting towards the red end of the spectrum. Oh, okay. That's redshift. So if a galaxy is really, really redshifted, it means it's moving away from us really fast. That's exactly right. That's amazing. Yeah. It's like we could theoretically hear the universe expanding if light were sound. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously we can't, but... It's a cool thought. It's really cool to think about. It is. And you know what? There's another American astronomer named Vesto Slipher. Okay. Who had already been measuring the red shifts of these nebulae. Oh, wow. Even before Hubble's big discovery. Interesting. Yeah. And he found that most of them were red shifted, meaning they were moving away from us at incredible speeds. But he didn't connect that with the idea of an expanding universe. Not quite. N no, that leap in understanding came with Hubble. So Slipher sees these redshifted nebulae, meaning they're moving away from us. Then Hubble shows that Andromeda and other nebulae are actually distant galaxies. Right. But they didn't put two and two together at that point. Not right away, but Hubble, being the brilliant astronomer he was, took Slipher's redshift data, combined it with his own distance measurements of Cepheid-eyed variables, and boom, that's when he had his eureka moment. Okay, this is where everything explodes wide open. Yes, Hubble discovered a direct correlation. The farther away a galaxy is from us, the faster it's moving away. It's like saying the farther away my friend is, the faster they're running away from me. But wait, so every galaxy we see is rushing away from us? Does that mean we're at the center of the universe? That's a common misconception. It's more like, imagine dots on the surface of a balloon. As the balloon inflates, all the dots move farther apart. Yeah. From any dot's perspective, all the other dots seem to be moving away. There's no single center on the balloon surface. Okay, so the universe is expanding, and that's why we see these redshifted galaxies racing away from us, no matter which direction we look. Exactly. But what does this all mean for us here on Earth? How does knowing the universe is expanding change our understanding of, well, everything? That's where things get even more profound, and that's what we'll delve into right after this. All right, so we're back. And I'm still trying to wrap my head around this whole expanding universe thing. It's such a huge concept. So where do we even go from here? What are the implications of knowing that the universe isn't static? Yeah. You know, that it's constantly changing. Well, for one thing, it completely changed our understanding of how the universe began. Before Hubble's discovery, most astronomers thought the universe was eternal and unchanging. But an expanding universe suggests that there was a beginning, a point in time, when everything was packed together incredibly dense and hot. So this is where the Big Bang Theory comes, and the idea that the universe started from this tiny point and has been expanding ever since. Exactly. Hubble's observations of those receding galaxies provided the first real evidence for the Big Bang Theory, which had been proposed a few years earlier, but was still very controversial at the time. So in just a few short years, we went from thinking our galaxy was the whole universe to realizing it's just one of billions and billions of galaxies in this vast and ever-expanding cosmos that began with a Big Bang. It's a pretty remarkable transformation in our understanding of the universe, and it's all thanks to the work of these incredible astronomers like Lovett, Slipher, and of course Hubble. Speaking of those astronomers, I think it's important to remember that, you know, they weren't just these scientific robots. Mm. They were real people with their own struggles and triumphs. Oh, absolutely. Take Henrietta Leavitt, for example. Yeah. Can you imagine being a woman working in science in the early 1900s? Oh, I can't even imagine. It was a male-dominated field, and women faced so much discrimination. And on top of that, she was dealing with hearing loss throughout her career, which must have made her meticulous work even more challenging. And yet she made this groundbreaking discovery about Cepheid variable stars. Her work literally changed the course of astronomy. It's amazing. It really is. And then you have Harlow Shepley, who was a brilliant astronomer in his own right. He made huge contributions to our understanding of the Milky Way, but he was so convinced that it was the entire universe. Imagine having your whole worldview shattered like that by Hubble's discovery. I wonder what was going through his mind when he read that letter from Hubble. Do you think he felt disappointed or maybe even a little bit excited that the universe was even more grand and mysterious than he had imagined? Probably a bit of both, I would <laughs> yeah. say. But what's important is that he was willing to accept the evidence even though it contradicted his own beliefs. That's what makes a true scientist. Yeah, being able to change your mind when presented with new information. It's something we could all learn from, right? Absolutely. 
and it highlights how important collaboration and open-mindedness are in science. Nobody has all the answers. It takes a collective effort to really push the boundaries of knowledge. So on this 100th anniversary of Hubble's discovery, let's celebrate not only the scientific achievement, but also the human element of it all. Mm. You know, the passion, the perseverance, and this incredible desire to understand our place in the universe. It's a story that continues to unfold. Hubble's discovery was just the beginning. We're still trying to understand the implications of an expanding universe. We're still grappling with big questions about dark matter, dark energy, the ultimate fate of the cosmos. There's still so much to learn. Who knows what other incredible discoveries are out there waiting for us and what they might tell us about our own existence. It's truly an exciting time to be studying the universe. It is. The journey of cosmic discovery that began a century ago continues to inspire us to look up at the night sky with wonder and keep exploring this vast and enigmatic universe we call home. That's a perfect note to end on. Thanks for joining us for this deep dive into the history of cosmology. Until next time, keep looking up and keep exploring.